It's 7 o'clock. Let's start our September board meeting and welcome everyone. First thing is we call the order. We want to declare that we have a quorum. And at this time, I look for a motion. I'd like to motion to uh, excuse Ms. Enriquez Pimblatt. Second. Motion and a second. Dr. Alvin? Yes. Ms. Lonis? Yes. Mr. Garden? Yes. Ms. Glover Jones? Yes. Mr. Eaton? Yes. I'll vote yes. Moving on, adoption of the agenda. To approve the uh, agenda as written. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Eaton? Yes. Ms. Glover Jones? Yes. Mr. Garden? Yes. Ms. Lonis? Yes. Dr. Alvin? Yes. I'll vote yes. We now have an agenda. Next, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have anyone that can assist us with that? <laughs> right there. Come on down. I knew we had someone there. That's you. <laughs> You're it. So, and, and you got some friends here with you. I brought a few friends. There's still a few more coming. You know what grade she's <laughs> yes. in? She is not in the grade. She is. She is our principal. Oh. <laughs> Very good. She is our principal. Principal it says it right there. Thank you, Dahlia. <laughs> Okay, so face the flight. Whenever you're ready. ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great job, guys. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Now, hold on a minute. Look at this. I want to give you the first one. Give you one. The memento of the public education. Yes. Signed by the guy that was in charge. Thank you all. And, and here, young lady, you can have one too. Put yeah. them in, you know, a grade. Thank you guys. Thank you all very much. As I read our agenda, it is our school of the month, so we're going to invite the whole group from Ivlin up and tell us tell us what's going on there. for having us here tonight at the Board of Education meeting. Um, Ivland is really proud to share with you some of the things that we have been doing in our building in regards to our social emotional learning. Um, we have our vision statement up here and I know we also know our mission statement and I think that when we think about what we're hoping our students graduate high school with, yes the academics are important. We want them to know all the reading and math and writing but we also want them to be people who are productive citizens of our country and so we work really hard at Iveland to prepare our students to meet the, the statements that are in our vision and mission according to that. And as you can see in our equity statement, I just highlighted a few phrases in particular that really speaks to the work that we're doing with our kids in order to make sure that every student is prepared um, for whatever their future brings for them. So I'm going to turn it over. I'll turn it over to you. Good evening. Uh, at Iveland <clears throat> and in education, we think a lot about um, Poslow's hierarchy of needs. So we consider these things with our students and know that our students, um, we need to meet those needs starting at the lowest level, those basic needs such as clothing, shelter, food. So we support that and ensure that we also, um, as we meet those needs, that we're able to um, assist in meeting the needs of the students at the higher levels of the pyramid that you see. 
So I have several students and staff members who are here with me tonight to share with you what we do at each level of our response to intervention pyramid. So again, we really believe that being proactive was what's the most important, and that means that every student has some opportunities to participate in social emotional learning. So we'll talk a little bit about how, what that looks like in the classroom in regards to our morning meetings. Um, I've got some teachers and students who will share about that. We'll talk about um, what happens like at our tier two level for students who need just a little bit of extra support but are functioning overall pretty well. And then some students who might need even a little bit more um, support. So we'll share from kind of the adult side and the student side. I will share that the students wrote all of their own messages. So even though they may be reading them, it is their words. I'll introduce them really quickly before I pass along the mic as well. But we have Aaliyah, who is one of our fourth graders. We have Zaria, who's one of our fifth graders. We have Dahlia, who's one of our third graders. We have Tristan, who's one of our fifth graders. And then we were expecting um, one of our second graders, John Dell. He hasn't quite showed up yet. We hope he shows up in the next few minutes. But if not, I'll share his thoughts too, because he has some really, really special thoughts as well. So I'm going to first turn it over to um, Ms. Stein, who will just share a little bit about what morning meetings look like in her classroom. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Ms. Stein. I teach third grade at Iveland. And so our my morning meetings start with everyone in a circle on the carpet. And we begin by everyone. Um, I have a talking, uh, a bear, a stuffed bear. And so they know that who's ever holding the bear is the only person who's talking. And we start with compliments. So someone gets the bear, I pull a name, and they have to give that person three compliments. And the reason we start this way and we talk about it is that it really helps them start off on the right foot. Um, they have to think about something nice. It might be somebody they got in an argument with the day before, but they have to come up with three nice things about that person. And then we use that time to discuss um, after that, it could be a fun question, like what did you do over the weekend? Or it could be maybe we have a guest speaker that day and we wanna talk about how should we be acting when a guest speaker comes in? And everyone has an opportunity to share and speak, and um, it's just a very easy entry point to the day. And I can also pick up on things that may be not okay and going on outside of school and pull certain students aside to speak with them later. So it's just a really great way to start the day off on the right foot. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening and I will be talking about morning meetings. Every day, our class meets for a morning meeting. In our class, we gather together on the carpet in a circle. We say hello to each other. Sometimes we do silly stuff. We talk about ourselves and what our favorite things are. Each week or so on a topic like that. We talk about, we, that we talk about. <laughs> Last year we talked about how to be, how to share. Last year we talked about how to be a good friend. We talked about how to share. We talked about integrity, doing the right thing when no one else is watching. We also talked about listening. We talked about including other people. I like starting the, each day with our morning meeting. It helps me get along with my class better. I learned about being a good person. And then we have Amanda who's going to talk a little bit more about what happens um, for everybody at school. Hello. Every day the entire building watches our video announcements. In our announcement, the things we talk about at an entire building. That helps us be better students. One thing we talk about is breathing. Miss Conley shows us breathing strategies and we practice all together. We do the breathing strategies in case we get upset and overwhelmed. We can use those strategies to calm us down. I have tried them and they definitely work. My favorite is a five finger strategy. I have anger issues and if someone gets me upset, I do that and I found myself down. I've never been in trouble at school before. Like I said, um, then we have some students who need a little bit of extra support at the tier two levels, and we'll let Ms. Griffin talk about what she does with check-in, check-out a little bit, and then we'll have Zaria share. All right. 
Good evening, I am Jacqueline Griffin. Um, I use check-in, check-out sheets to monitor the students' progress. The check-in, check-out sheets is a big part of our daily conversations. It helps students with accountability. We set a goal and each student work hard to reach that goal and the sheet serves as a reminder that I can do this. At first, I started check in, check out because I wasn't consistent with my behaviors. Miss Suiji talked to me about wanting to set some goals to her daily. She asked me to think about it at home overnight what some goals I wanted to work on were. I knew I needed to work on not talking back to the teachers or rolling my eyes at them. I did my check in, check out each day with Miss Griffin. I like meeting with Miss Griffin. She would give us rewards and encourage us to meet our goals. She didn't let us give up. In order to get a reward, you have to meet your goals. After you have to reach the percentage that you want to get. I don't think I need my check-in, check-out sheet anymore. I'm grown out of it, and I'm consistent with behaviors, and I don't like things that used to get me affected. Another big part of what we do is have students who will work with our counselors, and we have one of our counselors, Ms. Beasy, with us tonight, so I'll let her talk about what she does. Good evening. Um, I'm Angela Beasy. I'm one of the two school counselors at Iveland, um, and I was just going to talk to you guys a little bit about how I choose students for our small groups. Um, so for our students that need a little bit more targeted instruction, um, we, the other counselor and myself run groups, um, everything from classroom skills to social skills to grief, self-esteem, anxiety, whatever they might need. Um, and it's really a collaborative approach. We have survey data from teachers, we have survey data from students, we work with families and with the students themselves to identify their needs and getting to work with them in these small groups is one of my favorite parts of the job. Hello, my name is Tristan. When I met small groups, we talked about emotion. We talked about what you can do when you get upset. One thing I learned is that we can sit in a meeting if we need a help. When I was in Goose, we put a magic about anger, disgust, and joy. Meeting with the Goose really helped me because I learned to control my emotions more. I am definitely a better student. I don't have any problems with my emotions anymore. I still get upset, but I can control my emotions. And then like I shared, we always have a few students who need a little bit extra love. And so Ms. Griffin spends a lot of time with those friends. So I'll let her talk about what she does with them. So, my role in the refocus room is to teach students that all feelings are welcome. Also, how to control our emotions. We learn about zones of regulation skills. Um, we learn how to, uh, how, how to help regulate them. And uh, we learn about brain work and our stress tolerance. I meet each student where they are and build them up. All the kids are celebrated and we have a good time in my room. I'd like to share what John Dell wrote because I think it's, it's very touching. He said, I started using the refocus room because I had a chart and it wasn't always working for me. Each day, Ms. Griffin would pull me for a lesson with a few other kids. We worked on not getting mad. We would do breathing strategies and other strategies like learn how to come into recess without getting in trouble. She would talk to me about it. When I did have troubles, Ms. Griffin would come and get me and we would talk through it together. Sometimes I would take breaks in her rooms, especially if I was getting mad. She would also reward us when we had good days. I love Miss Griffin. I w wish I was with her all the time. She is fun. Miss Stevenson was also there last year, and she would say, there's my boy. I felt like I belonged there. And that was his words. Very hard work. <laughs> so we worked really, really hard at Iveland to make sure that we have all sorts of supports for kids, and we are seeing a lot of successes, including these four young ladies and gentlemen right here before you. Um, we've definitely seen it pay off and when you look at our office referrals and when you look at our school climate, and I'm just really, really proud of both of our staff who've worked so hard to put these structures in place for these um, young children and then the kids themselves who really have to put the work into effect. They're the ones who really have to, to learn the knowledge and apply it, so I'm really proud of them as well. So thank you guys for all you do and thank you for having us tonight. Before you leave, could the parents of these young young ones stand up and let us recognize you as well? 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was very nervous. <laughs> Item 1.6 on our agenda tonight is a report of closed session and the Board of Education met in closed session on August 8, 2024 for a discussion of personnel and real estate agenda items. With that, the next thing on our agenda is public comments. Do we have any forms for public comments? No, we do not. Okay, then we will move to our reports. President report is first one up. And I have a list of wonderful companies that have helped us put together a wonderful start of our school, uh, school year. So we are very grateful for our community partners who supported us and our students with additional back to school resources to help them get a strong start in this new year of 24 and 25. They did generosity and compassion toward our students from so many area businesses and faith organizations truly reflects our community support for all of our students. We are honored to receive donations from, for the third consecutive year, the staff of SSM Health DePaul Hospital. They collected thousands of school supplies and other items for the Rittner students to use this school year. The donations which filled an entire minivan includes hundreds of mesh backpacks that our high school students can use. These were distributed to the schools throughout the district. Employees of Merrick's based in Benton, so they're, they're not even around the corner and down the block, they're down the road a little bit, donated three carloads of school supplies and printers. The supplies were delivered to elementary schools by representatives from Teach for America. Reliable biopharmaceutical bio staff members collected four car loads. And these aren't Volkswagen car loads, by the way. These are good size amounts of filled backpacks for Rittner students. In total, the company donated more than 300 filled backpacks that were stuffed and delivered by employees from that company to the administration center. Reliable Biopharmaceutical is located right over here on Walton Road in Overland. Employees from Classic Air Care, not to plug them, but these are my guys, these are my go-to people here if I need them collected four large boxes of school supplies for the Rittner Elementary School students. Classic Air Care is an HVAC company and they do plumbing and they are located on North Warson Road. Strokow, Strokow Manufacturing donated two large boxes of school supplies for our students and Kleenex and we know how we're going to use Kleenex this fall for Rittner classrooms. The company is located near Lambert Airport, just around the corner in Hazelwood. Harmony Church of St. Louis, located on Walton Road, partnered with Lori Shoes in Kirkwood to provide footwear for Rittner High School students. Get this now, from Lori Shoes, over 487 pairs of shoes were donated, including brands like Nike, New Balance, I don't know what that is, UGG, uh, uh, UGG, I wasn't going to say that. So you see how many partners we have, far and wide, they're not just on Walton Road, they're not in Overland or St. John, they're down in Fenton, they're around the corner, they're down the street, helping our students, helping our neighbors have a great start of the school year. And to all of these guys, every company and every person that was involved in that, we truly appreciate their kindness, their generosity, and their dedication to every one of our students. So a heartfelt thank you to each company here and each organization that, that I mentioned. And more, I'm sure, that we didn't even have down. And that, my friends, ends the President's report. Moving on, Superintendent's report. 
Thank you, Dr. Thomas. And so, uh, board members, at the start of my report, I'd first like to welcome Representative Prouty for coming to our meeting this evening. Representative Prouty, always a, a blessing to have you here in the district. Thank you for uh, making written a priority and being here tonight. Uh, also, knowing that Representative Prouty was a former school counselor, I uh, want to just call out the fact that this has been a very difficult 36 hours in this district. Uh, in, in a conversation with our student representative before this meeting would invite us to do a little strategy to help us focus because there's so much going on right now uh, in the community and in the region. Um, there's a task that I find works for me. Maybe it will work for you. So I invite everybody to follow along with me and ask you to take your left hand, your left thumb, and make the thumbs up sign. I ask you to take your right hand, make the okay sign. And I would like you to switch back and forth five times. So from your okay sign to your thumbs up, back and forth five times. And we can't carry on the meeting until. <laughs> I'm done. I think I'm done. Do that for me. <laughs> so I just want to encourage us when there is a lot going on um, that is stressful, when there's a lot going on that's uh, on our minds. We had a conversation before the meeting started, and one of the board members gave voice to the fact that uh, in Rittner, this is not a district where you need to do the work alone. Uh, we're very much a district that attempts to do the work with. Uh, and if students or staff or community members are ex experiencing a high level of stress, uh, we do have support for all of you here in the district, and we encourage you to reach out to us uh, as opposed to going out to social media. Um, we uh, monitor social media, uh, but th the old verbal judo strategy is the goal to vent or is the goal to problem solve. This is not a criticism. It's more about problem solving. We have resources to support students and families and, and are all about the community. Um, and so just know that when tough times come together in this community, the work very much needs to be done with. So thank you to all of you that have been in contact with us uh, over the course of the last 36 hours as we work through a couple of issues. And, and thank you to the staff and students um, that have persevered and, and will work to ensure that tomorrow is a much better day uh, for all students than we've had the last 36 hours. Uh, so I'd like to give uh, voice to the fact that we've got our Hall of Fame and Homecoming uh, coming up here in a week. Next Friday, the 20th of September, we're going to celebrate our three newest Hall of Fame inductees. Those include uh, Mr. Bob Courtney, Class of 57, Mr. Greg Ransom, Class of 78, Ms. Kathy Nickens. Uh, she is a 2024 Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. So uh, they'll be inducted uh, in the lower lobby. Uh, that starts at 6 p.m. on Friday night. Uh, and then uh, for dinner, and then after that in the auditorium, we'll have the program. Then following, on the 21st, on Saturday, uh, we have our annual homecoming parade. It's going to kick off at 9 a.m. Uh, in the upper drive of the high school. Uh, the theme from the student leadership group at the high school is Once Upon a Rittner, a place where dreams come true. Uh, after the parade, uh, which kicks off at 9, Huskies will take on the Pattonville Pirates in the homecoming game uh, at 1 p.m. at Moore Field. It's going to be a great uh, weekend. I uh, also want to call out the fact that the National Hispanic Heritage Month uh, starts this weekend. Starts on September 15th, runs through October 15th. Uh, every one of our schools have plans in place uh, to celebrate Hispanic culture, which includes learning about cultural influences, famous people throughout history, as well as unique and diverse cultures within uh, Latin American countries. Uh, such as uh, rituals, clothing, art, music, and food. Uh, we will post uh, information on our website and throughout social media um, so that the community and you uh, can see how each of our schools are celebrating. Uh, one last thing uh, in the superintendent's report, I uh, want to call out a uh, MOU that's on consent tonight. It is with uh, a company called Bread and Roses, and it is a recommended partnership with our international Welcome Center uh, board members. There is no cost to the district for this partnership uh, with Bread and Roses. And what it does is it brings a uh, no-cost art lesson for two months to the International Welcome Center. So it'll be uh, nine sessions total uh, starting uh, next week if it's approved. 
uh, and continuing through the middle of November. Uh, and those sessions would be taking place in the afternoon at the IWC. Students would be creating unique and novel pieces of art. I uh, just wanted to call out that innovative partnership that is no cost to the district or the community. Concludes my report. Thank you very much. The next item we have is a Board of Education Student Representative report, and I would call on Ms. Alizea Smith. Okay, we can, we can go next slide. Next slide again, please. Okay, so exciting events. I want to say it was last week we had our senior sunrise, and so most of the seniors got up at 5.30, 5, went out on the field, we ate donuts, we put blankets down, we danced, listened to music, pretty much just hung out before school started, and got a bunch of pictures in. That one picture is me and my friend Tegan, and then the picture in the top right corner <laughs> is all of the seniors and a lot of them came we had a pretty good participation rate and then next slide please and then this friday we have our the hall of fame dinner and then the saturday we have our homecoming parade at 9 a.m and then the football game against pattonville at 1 and then the dance at 7 p.m Oh, and I'm on home coming for. Right. Um, oh, that could be my Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Next thing then we go to MSBA NSBA report. Ms. Clover Jones. Um, so as you all know, we have a couple um, upcoming events uh, in October. We have the, which they'll probably talk about this in the video as well, um, but I'll go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> we have the um, MSBA board conference in Kansas City, October 17th and 18th. Uh, Brittner has the opportunity to do a presentation uh, in concert with board members and administrators in the district specifically focusing on the CBL journey in our Rittner School District that is happening Friday afternoon. Um, so for those who can come up that way to support, we'd love to see you there in those spaces. We also have some board representatives that are going to the CUBE conference, which is the NSBA's uh, Council on Urban Board Educators. That is happening October 27th through the 30th. Uh, that's in Las Vegas. A couple of uh, the, our board members are going out to participate in that as well. Um, I know we just recently had our Region 7 meeting. Um, they have moved the location, so unfortunately for the Rittner board, we didn't get the opportunity to go and participate in that meeting. Um, you want to cue the video? Welcome to the September edition of the Missouri School Boards Association's Board Report. With schools across the state back in session, don't forget to share the excitement of students, staff, and the entire public school community with your local legislators. Invite your legislators to celebrate the return to school with a day tour in your school district. MSBA President Jonathan Russell says that activities such as legislator visits are just part of year-round advocacy efforts. Well, it's important because you don't want to the first time that you ask them about an issue to be at the Capitol when they're getting ready to vote on something, you want to have developed a relationship with them prior to that. So doing this during their time off when they're not in session and they're back in their districts is a perfect opportunity to start to develop that relationship. When the legislature returns in January, Missouri is guaranteed to have a new governor, new leadership in both the House and Senate, and at least 58 new House members and 10 senators almost a third of the legislature. MSBA Senior Director of Governmental Relations, Brant Shields, says that there are ways that school board members can help these new legislators as they take office. Legislators will look for trusted sources of information and advice on a variety of topics. And you are perfectly positioned to be a trusted voice on public education issues for your community. But the building of these relationships with legislators doesn't begin in January, it begins now. One of the best ways to engage current and future legislators 
is to invite them into your schools. Help show them the fantastic work your students and teachers are doing. And with the start of the next legislative session just around the corner, make sure you don't miss the upcoming Fall Delegate Assembly. This Delegate Assembly is the chance to have your voice heard on issues surrounding public education as we head toward the next legislative session. The Fall Delegate Assembly will be held during the Friday of Annual Conference. And if you haven't registered for the conference yet, it's not too late. The 2024 MSBA Annual Conference, in cooperation with the Missouri Association of School Administrators and the Missouri Association of School Business Officials, will be held October 17th through the 19th in Kansas City. The event will once again feature numerous breakout sessions and workshops, many presented by school leaders from districts throughout the state, plus the Education Expo and another great lineup of general session speakers. And once again, the My Favorite Book Drive will be back at the annual conference as well. Donate your favorite pre-K through third grade book and be entered into a drawing to win 500 books from Scholastic. Increase your district's chance with your whole board's participation. At least six districts will win. Each winner will receive at least one curated Scholastic collection of books along with donated books. Winners will be announced at the second general session on Saturday. One of the primary areas of emphasis for Jonathan Russell during his year as president is literacy. And he says that the My Favorite Book Drive is a great way to help students. I just want to extend a challenge to all board members to make sure that you bring some books to donate to our book drive at conference. For every book that you donate, you get your name put in a drawing to win some books for your school district. So I won last year and, and, and that was amazing. I brought three books last year and got three chances to win. Literacy is the key to all education. You know, once you um, gain a really good, strong reading skills or a passion for reading, that, leads, that opens so many other doors in, in every other subject. That's it for this month. Thanks for allowing us to have some time at your board meeting and we'll see you in October for the next MSBA Board Report. Welcome to the September edition of the Ms. So I'm not for sure how many of us are going in October. Is everybody going? Mm -hmm. um, but if you do go, please encourage you to bring some books uh, for the um, book drive. I think that is a great initiative, um, not just on, for the prize that you will win, but just the donation of the books to uh, understand how important literacy is. Also, just a reminder that the emails that are coming out to your board email accounts regarding some of the legislation that's happening in Missouri, as well as on the national and federal level, um, just be mindful of some of that because it is going to directly impact us uh, in the spaces. And most definitely appreciate Representative Prouty being in this space tonight, uh, taking out the time to share with us. Thank you very much. Next report, special school district, and that calls on Mr. Rob Eaton. So we have our next governing council meeting in about a week and a half, two weeks, it's the 24th. Um, <clears throat> many of us have been meeting and talking as we, I think it's been seen, and I love special school district, I do, but they also do some really off the wall things. And the fact that we have a huge budget deficit and we just hired 12 new administrators and turned around and made people deputy associate, deputy associate uh, superintendents and yeah there's just some things that don't add up and so as governing council we've been meeting um, just preparing some questions and some things that we are expecting some answers to so as soon as we get those we will be passing that information along um, I am going to also try to meet before that meeting with Dr. Kilbride and Ms. Faust um, one of the concerns that we're seeing is this exodus from um, North County um, and seeing some of our uh, special ed teachers moving towards Parkway, Rockwood, um, having that as a concern with some of the cuts that are going to have to be made and the ability that a staff member can just put in for a transfer and be moved and we've got to, they've got to give us some kind of confidence that they're going to keep us stop and staffed with 
well-educated individuals to continue to teach our, our students. So we're going to meet, to, I'd like to meet with these two individuals to mm -hmm. figure out where our district stands prior to going into that meeting. Absolutely. We have to have a voice at that table, too. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, moving on to our business items, 3.1 is our Connect contract approval. Yep. So, uh, Dr. Thomas and board members, we've got some guests uh, that are coming up for a presentation. So, for tuning in your team, would you please come up? Good evening. How are you? Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Yeah, so I'm Christina Kadima, and this is Michael Lee. We're here to present the Connect Platform to the board. First, I'm going to start off with our vision. The Connect Platform, we want to create a, an environment of just giving back, allow greater alumni, greater students to talk to alumni for college and career guidance. That's our mission with Connect is ultimately to prepare greater students like never before for college and career prep that no other district is doing, but bring back our alumni, parents, and high achieving peers from our community. Then the equity statement, we want to make sure every single student gets this opportunity. Every student on Connect will have an equal opportunity to prepare for postgraduate life. I've mentioned a lot of what Connect, just the word Connect, but no one really knows what it is quite yet. So what Connect is, is a platform we're building out that allows current Rittner students to talk to alumni, parents, and high achieving peers for career and college guidance advice. Think of it as like a LinkedIn but built for high schoolers. Our goal is to increase alumni engagement and just enable students before you make that big decision about the postgraduate. We have some screenshots here of our product. Let's kind of walk you through what it'll look like on the student side. First, you have your profile. Here, you're entering just data about yourself, your interests, and just like what's your career path goals. Unlike Mark Zuckerberg, we're not selling this data. Instead, what we're doing with this data is we're using it for our matching algorithm. Here, we take away a lot of the heavy lifting for students where, hey, that now we're matching you with people who are share your similar interests, so it's just a simple click. Once the student has made that simple connection, then you can talk and you can ask those questions like that you may be afraid to ask a counselor, you may just not know how to ask. You're able to connect with our mentors here and just get a one-on-one -on -one talk. There's also group chat features and just there. Then here's our posting board. Here, students are able to just give a little bit of their insight that they know, alumni can talk as well, and events will be shown here. So Noon will be able to post events like, hey, we have this person coming to talk, we see you have some of your interest, why don't you register for it? Then, for the data side, again, we are not selling this data, it only goes to Noonan. This is access to how many students, the alumni, and just everything here. We make reports for the counselors, so before the counselor would meet with the student to get a nice little report, then once they're meeting with the student, they get a more insights inc report. Here is the messages they've sent on the platform, the posts they've currently made, the comments, and then the connections. Parents are also able to see this from their students, so we keep everything completely transparent on the platform. Our goal is to re just engage the Ritter alumni community. We're graduating about two to three two to three hundred students on average, and the goal is just like they are learning a lot in just their career paths. So why don't we bring them back so they can interact with current Ritter students? So currently, the Connect Impact we have 130 colleges represented from schools like WashU, Harvard, UMSL, SLU. We also have 208 call current career path, unique paths on there. Then we have 57 years of Huskies alumni that we're bringing back. Then lastly, um, we're also recently partnered with the WashU Scholars Department. What this means is the WashU Office of Scholars, our regular students are able to talk to WashU students as well. That's going to be about 200 of them, and we're working on more partnerships to expand the network for regular students. So next steps, we're going back live September 19th. A lot of people think we're just going to be a web app, but we always try to go better. We're going to be a mobile app so students can access Connect without having to necessarily pull out their Chromebooks and they'll just have access to it everywhere. We're also going to integrate a job platform. We're trying to work with many local businesses in the area, so whenever regular students are like, hey, this is the path I want to go down, they're able to apply directly on the Great Connect path. We're going to help students build their resume and just apply to those jobs. Next up is Debbie. At first, Debbie kind of scared people with the tool we created in-house. Kilbury can tell you about it, but where we're given a first name, a last name, and an image, thanks to him with the class of 1980s, we're able to find it. With class of 1980s, we had about an 81% success rate of finding them. And Kilbride's like, can you do it again with the class of 2023 and 108-day follow-up? 
gave us about 40 names, 95, that's going to be 38, we were able to find 38 out of the 40 students on there, and we're going to get continue to help the Raider community with the 180-day follow-up this year. If I could speak on that a little bit, so the uh, 180-day follow-up is an uh, MSIP requirement. We have to reach out to students six months after graduation, and are students doing what they say they were doing? Um, we struggle to connect with some of the students. Some of the graduates are hard to find. So thinking creatively with the tool from Debbie, from Fortuna and team. So what it does is it takes a picture and it ages the picture. And then it, the student has a social media footprint, which we all do. It's able to locate where the student is, able to locate their social media handle, able to locate email addresses, possibly locate uh, phone numbers, uh, we were able to gain by 12 percentage points the positive response rate on our 180-day follow-up. So with the tool, we're able to demonstrate a significant gain through uh, finding these kids through social media. So evidence of, evidence of impact is very present. We also found two more graduates that were being done that before. So one thing we're really good at is we're going to get a combining our tool. So the Connect platform in Debbie our goal be, if there's a demand for a certain pathway that we don't currently have, we would use our Debbie tool to go reach out and find that pathway for our students as well, to just give them a, a more opportunity. I want to say thank you to the board for just giving us the opportunity to present. Thank you, Michael Lee, Rosie Khan, Ethan Ang, the people with the majors, Alex Kobe Uko, Brandon McGee, Luke Griggs, and Kate Wood of Westfall. Board members, you, you know, so as you know, Fortuna is a Husky alum. He's got uh, personal goal to be the youngest inductee into the Hall of Fame in history. Yep. Uh, the Connect platform, as you may know, the St. Louis Business Journal runs an entrepreneurship challenge every year. There were 36 startups that were a part of the competition at WashU, and out of the 36 startups, Connect won. Took first place in the state uh, in, in the Business Journal Startup Challenge. Let's give them a round of applause. For that. Real opportunity for the district, as Fortuna had shared, to connect alums with current students and with the Debbie tool for us to not only support our 180-day follow-up, but for example, like the Hall of Fame. We've got some amazing Husky graduates are out there. We need to bring those people in to help them stay connected so that as we are, as the Hall of Fame committee is doing their work, uh, they have a, a well-rounded group of people to choose from from all different levels, all sectors, all age groups. It's an impressive tool, board members. You've heard a number of presentations from Fortuna and team. And tonight, we're asking for your approval uh, of a $15,000 cost for the contract to implement Connect. Any questions? All right, let's look for recommendations. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to recommend to approve the Connect contract as presented to the board for $15,000. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions, discussions, or thoughts? Hearing none, call the vote. Ms. Clover Jones? Yes. Mr. Gardner? Yes. Mr. Eaton? Yes. Dr. Alvin? Yes. And Ms. Lotus? Absolutely, yes. I think we get in this. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait to see what you create next. <laughs> Three point two is our annual adoption of the equity statement. And with that, we call upon Ms. Evelyn Gilliam, who is our director of professional development. Good evening, board. Good evening. We are here to discuss our annual adoption of the equity statement and we have our vision for the district and our mission and we just start with the definition of equity in the district we did not get any updates to any portions of the equity statement this year so this evening is really to kind of take some more time to reflect and then also ask if there's any clarifications and then request approval. So this is our part of the board of the equity statement that thinks about how we treat everyone. So this has been part of how we operate for the past four years. So what are some ways to continue to support this effort?
Who does all this part? I know. Oh. <laughs> I think we need to make sure that it has relevance and it is used in a, in a positive force to move our students, our classrooms forward. That's just a guess. I think we need to. <clears throat> As we make decisions, as we look at things, our equity statement is not just something that we read and go through on the slide. It's something that we're actually looking at and going, are we doing this for parents? Are we doing it for students? Are we doing it for staff? Are we doing it? And when we look at it from those lenses, then it becomes actually an active document that we're using, and that's how we help make our decisions. So thinking about using equity as a lens, which is what you just mentioned, um, how has our equity statement allowed us to minimize assumptions when issues arise and support, like make our support equitable across our district? It takes feelings out of it, to a degree. I mean, there's still feelings, but it, it, we're looking at each piece of it and we're not just sticking in one spot. I think it gives us more guidelines. When you don't know, you look at that and find your, find your path. I think it causes um, us to, to slow down and look at, you know, when we're making these decisions, which is, I think, coming up on your next slide, uh, thinking about those three questions, like, who are we benefiting? Is there someone that we're leaving out when we're making these decisions? Um, are we disproportionately impacting one group by making a, this particular decision? Do we need to clarify things? Um, and then being more intentional, I would say, when we're making those decisions, who's missing at this table as we're making the decision? What voices are missing? Um, so taking a step back. So this is just the reminder that our equity statement is connected to our equity policy, ACJ and we are seeking to approve the readoption of the equity statement for the 24-25 school year. The question? Yes. In your opinion, is, is this working? Is this a tool that is viable and usable and is being used? I think for what I see in board meetings and board decisions, yes. There are times when I have heard teachers talk about it. Um, we do have components of our equity work built into our portrait of a graduate, which we will be rolling more work of that, more, part, more parts of the work out with that later this year. So that will then translate it all the way down to the students. Um, but right now it's really more kind of at the, the balcony level and it'll get down more to the student level as we do more with our portrait of a graduate. With school districts in our area not approving equity statements and taking steps backwards in what they are looking at through their lens, I just want to make sure that our equity statement can guide us, can help us, can get us where we need to be. And if it's not, we need to put more teeth in it. We need to put more. Yeah. to make sure we get where we're going. So I think because we do have a connection with the equity policy, that our statement does give that guidance. Uh, but it is that, it's guidance. So that's part of the beauty of, of re-adopting it every year because we can always go back and adjust and change things and rewrite whatever parts we need to to make sure that it's going to support the students. That's what I like about it. It evolves, just like we're evolving. And everything we're talking about is beyond just us sitting up here. It's through the district, and as you said, getting down to that next level. So I think that is very important. It's making sure that it's not just us, it's everybody. Not to um, put our student rep on the spot, but thinking about things from a, what do you see in the essence of 
day to day? Do you feel like that this is something that you see being emulated in within our classrooms and district? I mean, I very much do see like everyone is accepted. Like teachers are very much accepting and like they're gonna do as much as they can for you as long as you're safe and you're doing mentally okay. So I think that the equity statement does really do apply in the classrooms. It might just be the students that don't know the equity statement exists. Maybe that's what we have to charge and do this next year is post it, plan it, put it out there, you know, to the walls so everybody see what we are. motion at this time would be great. I'd like to make a motion to approve the 2024 annual adoption of the equity statement as presented. A second. Motion and a second. Are there any other questions or thoughts? If not, Mr. Eaton. Yes. Dr. Alvin. Yes. Ms. Lonis. Yes. Ms. Glover Jones. Yes. Mr. Gardner. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a year. All right. <laughs> Have you seen me before? Probably. <laughs> Item 3.3 .3 is the approval of our TOPS loan. And for that, we call Dr. Phil Pusateri, our CFO. Good evening, board members. Good evening. This builds on our uh, meeting last week when we spoke about certificates of participation. We'll touch on a few of those items, um, and then we'll hand it off to Lorenzo Boyd from Stiefel. We also have Megan Williams, our bond counsel, uh, in the audience. Equity statement applies also to when we're thinking about uh, certificates of participation in finance. It's important that diversity among families is valued, sought, and embraced. And we're excited about the way that the new site on St. Henry Lane can serve the diverse uh, groups of students who will be housed there. Spent some time since July talking about certificates of participation. You remember what the cops are going to pay for. They'll pay for the purchase of the property plus approximately $6.7 million in renovations. Mike Smith's up next to talk about uh, construction. The good thing about cops, we can access all those funds now and then pay it back over 15 years at a very low interest rate. Um, the state wouldn't allow us to use our uh, capital revenue to pay for all that in one year, so it's a way to do it uh, at, at a good interest rate. Mr. Boyd's going to speak more uh, closely about the financing, uh, but in general, we're borrowing 6.3 million bucks. Uh, the true interest cost, there's some volatility in the market, so the slide says 3.84 when it was written. Uh, it's actually 3.88. It's about the same, but it's a little higher. Uh, the total interest is still $2.8 million. Talked about this uh, last week. Um, one of the disadvantages of COPS is we pay for COPS through our own operating funds, not through our debt service funds. Debt service is, uh, operating funds is the same pot of money that we use to pay salaries. Uh, debt service is a separate, dedicated uh, pot of money just to pay back debt. So if uh, Mr. Boyd shared that Stiefel has run some numbers, and this is just a possibility for the board to consider over the next few years, but if we were to run, say, a $30 million uh, bond issue, a zero rate increase, so it would be the same rate, in, uh, give or take, April of 26, uh, that would take, to answer your question, Ms. Lonis, from last week, uh, that would be paid off uh, 20 years in 2046. Uh, but that could generate $30 million plus. And if we were to pay back some of the, what we're borrowing now in COPS, let's say we have $5 million that we still owe, uh, that money would go back into our operating funds and we could continue to look at those funds for salary and just use our debt service bucket to pay for the COPS. So something for the board to consider but no rush now, something to keep in the back of your mind. This morning, uh, we had a call with uh, Stiefel, and uh, Stiefel 
was able to reach out to uh, buyers. And at this time, I'll hand it over to Lorenzo to, to talk about that. And anything else you want to bring to the board? Thanks, Dr. Pusateri. Um, as Gary just mentioned, uh, my name is Lorenzo Boy with Stiefel. I must say that when I pulled up to the meeting and I saw the crowd was filled, I thought they all were here for me. <laughs> turns out they're not. Um, but I'm glad to be here. Um, it's a pleasure always being back in front of you all. I think I the first started working with the River School District in 1997. I know I don't look that old, but um, that was in 1997, almost uh, 30 years ago. So this is one of the first clients that actually I started working with that in 1997 after starting with AGRS in 1992. But before I talk about uh, the certificates of participation, I do want to, which is the main course, obviously, I want to kind of talk about um, two things. And I think Dr. Kilbride talked about this probably a little bit earlier. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the Fabric of Society program, which uh, this past year, um, Stiefel uh, enrolled uh, the Rittner School District in the Fabric of Society program. That's a $2,000 a scholarship to a senior um, that was awarded to, I think, Kaya Merriman um, this past year. So she, she received that scholarship um, and will be enrolling um, a Rittner School District next year in that same program. It's a two to three year cycle, so we hope to have uh, even, more, um, even more students enrolled next year in that program so that they can be awarded a possible $2,000 scholarship. That program for Steve was now uh, in 36 <coughs> states across the country. Um, so we award approximately over $200,000 scholarships to students in 36 states um, across the country. Um, and it's a pretty neat program, so I'm glad to have Rittner School District uh, involved in that this past year. Um, another thing I want to bring up is Operation Warm. Operation Warm was a program that we started at Stiefel uh, approximately 10 years ago. And every year I'm tasked with uh, selecting the school district to be part of that program that meets certain criteria. And this year, We've selected Rittner School District to participate in that program. We're going to give out um, approximately 250 to 300 coats um, this year to students in the Rittner School District. And talking to Dr. Kilbride, Dr. Crusateri, we're going to select the IWC um, um, a school to kind of give those uh, coats to. So we'll be uh, in the school probably in late November, um, I'm sorry, probably before Thanksgiving. To, to give those those coats to those students in, in that uh, elementary school. And uh, that will be a three-year process as well, we're, we're at Rittner. And we would hope that um, you can select a different elementary school each year um, that we actually partner with you on this program. So again, that's Operation Warm, and we'll be uh, contacting, um, I guess, Dr. Pusateri and two individuals at that school in the next coming months to kind of um, talk about the distribution of those coats, and it's a real thrill for me just because actually I'm involved in being in that program and I actually get a chance to go to the schools and help hand out those coats. It's great, uh, board members. When Lorenzo brought this uh, idea to me, you know, many students that are IWC, um, when they come to the country, they don't have a coat, and so um, making this uh, possibility for kids as the weather starts to turn, possibly might be the first couple of months in the country, can be a real life changer. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, well, getting to uh, the main issue at hand, uh, certificates of participation. So about six weeks ago, uh, we started this process in terms of uh, doing this financing for the Ridden School District. And today, after starting this process about six weeks ago, I think about two weeks ago, we went through the underlying rating program, uh, rating uh, analysis. And I'm just pleased to say that uh, Rittner was again affirming its underlying rating this year of AA minus from standard of boards. The AA minus is in the top 15% of all school districts uh, in the state of Missouri that were rated. There are almost 200 school districts that are rated by standard of boards um, in terms of their underlying bond rating. Your underlying bond rating is almost like an individual credit score. Um, so with that, they were affirmed that underlying rating at AA minus with AAA being the highest. It goes from AAA to AA plus, to AA to AA minus. So with this, because these were certificates of participation, um, these certificates were rated one notch below, which is A plus. And so today we went into the market to sell 6.3 million uh, certificates of participation. We received a little over 10 million of orders, so we were able to lower interest rates slightly uh, by two to three basis points in two different maturities. It may not seem like a lot, but in our world, that's a, that's a ton, two to three basis points. So, but, and that's, that's solely because we were able to get over 10 million of orders 
um, whenever you have a situation where you have more orders than, bond, than bonds or certificates, you get the opportunity to lower rates to get some of those buyers to disappear. Um, so we're very pleased with that outcome. We're going to actually close this transaction on October 2nd. And at that point, we're going to actually, uh, Steve was going to wire $6.7 million uh, to the school district to start this project. Um, and I asked for any questions. And I don't know, my attorney's always with me. <laughs> well, your attorney um, is always with me. Um, do you have anything to add? No, before you tonight is a resolution for the board that will approve the transaction and all the associated documents. So I'm happy to answer any questions on this. Run so that it's, it's always great to have you here in the house and partnering with you in these projects is just, just make it so smooth and so easy for us. Uh, you're one of Ritter's treasured friends, I'm telling you. Not just because you brought us checks, but because <laughs> you get it done for us and for our kids. No problem. Thank you. If there are no other questions or comments for them, we will look for a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution as presented. Second. Motion as second. Any thoughts or questions? Call the vote. Mr. Eaton? Yes. Dr. Alvin? Yes. Ms. Lonis? Yes. Mr. Gordon? Yes. Ms. Clover Jones? Yes. And it's my honor to make it unanimous. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for your hard work. Good to see you. Okay, moving on, September 12, 2024, construction update. Mr. Michael Smith. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right, so today <clears throat> I am going to speak about the uh, construction update for September. Of course, uh, excellent facilities help us reach the mission and our vision. Um, and our resources are allocated so every student gets what they need. And what students need are safe facilities to ensure a great educational experience in, in River. Of course, we also need to make sure that we have consistent and equitable environments for all students to learn. Uh, going to uh, speak to the progress on the former Holy Trinity property. And of course, our plans for making it a uh, uh, space for uh, great things to happen uh, for learning. Uh, Holy Trinity uh, is a, a campus and property campus of two buildings. Uh, a main building, which uh, contains several classrooms, uh, a cafeteria, a kitchen, and also uh, that leads off into the sanctuary. There's another a building off to the side, uh, which we are calling the Annex. Uh, that has four classrooms and it has two rooms uh, uh, downstairs as well. Uh, it needs a lot of work. Uh, it's in great shape, but it does need work in order to bring it to our standards. Um, and so, like I said, they're, they're in good con condition. Amoresco, uh, who is our performance contractor, they've taken the time to thoroughly go over the building and then have come up with a plan for, for the very so we've completed mold abatement. The uh, annex uh, area had been unconditioned for a long period of time. There was water intrusion, uh, had caused uh, a mold intrusion in there. So uh, we have removed all of the mold, remediated that. Uh, of course, now we have to do repairs to it because a lot of drywall had to be cut out in order to bring it to the standard. And then of course, uh, you know, made sure that antimicrobial agents were used to make sure that it doesn't return. Um, for the annex, uh, so we have to you know, do some drywall repair and a whole bunch of other renovations that you can see uh, in order to get that up and running. We wanted to do that as quickly as possible. And the reason we want to do that is because we're looking forward to housing uh, early childhood students at this building. Um, there are four classrooms. And uh, by, by providing those four classrooms, uh, we should be able to get the 75 or 80 uh, students that are on the current waiting list for early childhood, uh, get them into a classroom so that they can start their learning experience. 
The main school uh, also needs work. We uh, are ready to start asbestos abatement in that space. Uh, tomorrow, I'm actually walking through the space with three um, uh, vendors for abatement uh, for asbestos, uh, so that we can make a choice on which one we will use for that uh, service. And then a lot of other renovations, fire suppression, we're adding a sprinkler system to that building, HVAC, re, uh, uh, improvements where those are necessary. We're not replacing all of the HVAC, but just the uh, units that are, are in need of being replaced, kitchen remodel, safety and security systems, in order to bring it to that standard that all of our other schools have. So like I said, uh, the annex, that is where we're uh, hoping to get that, and that is a, a priority for opening for early childhood classrooms. And then the main school for the International Welcome Center and also for the Center for Edu uh, Gifted Education. Uh, there's a designated space there as well uh, so that we can um, move the current gifted program from Ritter Middle to um, uh, the former Holy Trinity. So as far as our budget considera considerations, Amoresco has quoted uh, $4,997,712 for renovations to the Holy Trinity, Holy Trinity buildings uh, in order to complete all of that uh, work that I, that I showed you. And therefore, I'm recommending uh, that the board approve that amount for renovations uh, to the Holy Trinity buildings. And, of course, I'm more than happy to answer questions. And board members, some of the urgency with this work, too, as we know, there, there is urgency to uh, get students into this building as safely and as quickly as possible. As Mike said, we do maintain a waiting list of 75 to 80 students in line with that vision of trying to work towards one year of early childhood learning for every incoming kindergarten student. Um, Pending approval, uh, it is possible uh, that we may be able to get those students into the building later on in this school year. Uh, and as you know, the IWC uh, grew to 140 students last year, far outpaces the uh, space available at the North Wing of Hague, um, making space as quickly as possible for that, and then transitioning the Center for Gifted Ed from Rittner Middle School. Um, there was not significant conversation around these numbers heading up to this meeting. Um, but th that's the reason for the urgency uh, in, in seeking your support for the upgrades to this case. So we're going to need a committee to get a new name for this building. I agree with you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll charge him with doing that. Yes. Any other questions? This uh, cost already has the contingencies built into it. That's correct. Yeah, so, so Amoresco, um, unless there's com something completely unforeseen, but Amoresco does not uh, do change orders. You know, so, so that's going to be the cost. Um, so, you know, what they they have gone in and they are charged with, you know, going over the entire building, looking at you know things that you know may or may not happen. And, and so, you know, there will not be chain comes to this now. If we get down the road, and then one of the HVAC units that we were planning on continuing to use breaks down, then that's that's not something we would have force, foreseen. Um, but you know, getting into a wall and there being something that we didn't expect, they will be responsible for covering that cost as 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 presented. Shelters or anything like that. Correct. Because it's an existing building, we're not required to, to have any um, storm shelters. If we were uh, increasing the space, um, increasing the capacity uh, uh, of, of the building by more than 50 individuals, we would be. But because it's already, it already has a, a, a capacity, um, we're not required to do that. So we've, we've worked with the fire marshal through this entire process. He's gone over the building top to bottom with us um, to make sure that that would be an issue. You're welcome. And we've worked with that Fresco before, haven't we? Oh, yes. They, they, they have been fantastic. So uh, they have worked with us through um, 
the uh, Secure Entries Project. Um, they are currently the, uh, the uh, performance contractor that is uh, replacing the boilers throughout the district, a lot of HVAC work around the district. Um, they have been wonderful to work with. When they say they're going to get it done, they're going to get it done. They, um, have, they meet their deadlines. They, um, you know, they're proactive. Very, very happy working with them. So with that being said, yes. and us trying to get to where we're getting them at, getting the students in there by the end of the year, when are we starting the hiring process? with a start date because we're also talking about doing this halfway through the year, which is hard to get employees at that time because we're going to need teachers and... So, so to clarify, at some point during the year, the idea that we would be doing this at semester, that's not possible. Like, so we're, the conversation has been later in the year, potentially after spring break is what we would be looking at. Hiring season generally starts July, or uh, January 1, I'm sorry. But usually we're hiring and people are coming in the next year. Do we feel like we're going to be able to get candidates that are willing to come in starting April 1, let's say? So what we know is that we're going to be targeting graduates, right? And so we also have a strong partnership with Maryville University and also we have 15 Maryville University student teachers in the district. Uh, we have more than 15 also student teachers in the district. In the name that we're trying to grow our own, we're going to have to grow our own. And the fact that we have 30 student teachers in the district, that's going to help us. I, but I will tell you, hiring high quality people is an absolute challenge. Have faith in the HR department. Um, but, but that's why, you know, being purposeful about trying to invest in and welcome in as many student teachers as possible, it's so that we can make sure we're getting the best in the best for programs such as the expansion of IWC, the expansion of early childhood, and so on. So are these. Are they working? Do we have any working with our current uh, students at the Early Childhood Center? So that way, when we go into the new building at the end of the year, we're able to have them already know the program and know the steps so that those students are getting value at the end of the year. There are two. Of the 30, there are two at the Early Childhood Center. There are large clusters that are at K-2. Uh, because in Missouri, that early childhood certificate is birth to third grade. Um, so anybody that is up kindergarten first, second, or third, those will also be candidates for early childhood. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? the MRSCO float of $4,997,712 for the renovations of the former Holy Trinity building. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Let's call the vote. Ms. Glover Jones. Yes. Mr. Gardner. Yes. Ms. Lotus. Yes. Dr. Albert. Yes. Mr. Eaton. Yes. Sir, I'll vote yes. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Let's get it done, Mike. Okay. I was getting bored. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. Mike has never said that. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Item 3.5 on our agenda is the AMI schedule survey follow up, and we call Dr. Deneen Stewart. follow-up to the alternative methods of instruction survey that went out in September and providing academic supports to our students and our families and um, is really aligned to our mission and vision and then also and also our equity statement um, really ensuring that we receive the input and value the input of all of our stakeholders as we surveyed our stakeholders and also made some adjustments based on their feedback. So just really to recap, um, 
what we talked about in August, uh, the results of the survey in May, 57.1% of the respondents wanted all AMI days, six days. Um, and then there was questions at our meeting, at the board meeting, about uh, the schedule and uh, the start times for the schedule. Um, so we sent out another survey to get input from our stakeholders on the times for AMI days. And then also there were some questions about the communication plan uh, to ensure that our staff and our students and our families understand that the completion of work is the goal for attendance. So just to review, this was our schedule that was presented, uh, which really re is a reduction in time for um, our total hours of instruction. Um, to last year, we had four hours and 40 minutes for elementary, middle, and high. We reduced that to two hours and 20 minutes based on the survey that was given in May, uh, and then an office hour of one hour. Um, at our early childhood, we talked about having 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the afternoon, and then an office hour for one hour as well. We sent out another survey just to get some clarity around the start times and um, whether we should have those two sessions at early childhood. Uh, sent that out in September, the 3rd through the 8th, and it um, received 797 responses from parents and family members and staff and students. Uh, we didn't get a high response from students. Students were taking the evaluate test, start testing, so they were um, a little busy taking tests at that time. So just wanted to share uh, the questions from the survey. Um, the survey really consisted of uh, the definition just really explaining to our um, all of our stakeholders what AMI dates are, an explanation of that completed assignments equals attendance. Um, so really the School for Early Childhood uh, the question was really focused on uh, whether we should have two sessions, um, an AM and PM session, one 30-minute session in the AM, or one 30-minute session in the PM. And then Brittany High School, the question was really focused on the start time, whether we should just go with the 8.05 time, whether we should start at 9.05, um, and other responses. So overall, um, the question was asked if they were very supportive of the schedule or somewhat supportive or not supportive at all. So overall, the results were very positive. 72.8% of the respondents were very supportive of the schedule. Um, there were some mixed um, responses as it relates to the School for Early Childhood Education. Just really, you know, and really uh, it was some great feedback actually. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later about early childhood and then also written in high school. Um, there were some responses as it relates to the start times um, also. And you know some of the um, people really were appreciative that we reduced the time for AMI based on that proposed schedule. So uh, the shortened time on the schedule was very well received. Um, they felt, most families felt like that was um, best for our students. Um, and then the accountability for task completion, um, you know, some of our families felt that that was good to um, have that expectation, which is a safe expectation. Um, for the survey, there was from some of our um, teachers, there was concerns about the gap between online class and then the office hours. Um, really some of the teachers would like to bud the office hours up with the online instruction right after the online instruction. Uh, some of our families did not, um, thought it was kind of complex to try to have managed child care um, and while they're trying to support the child with AMI and some of the um, assignments that their child had to do. Um, and then one particular comment that um, a parent had is that they felt that they've been heard, um, that the AMI days are preferred and a shortened schedule is much more appropriate and productive uh, for online learning. 
So based on the survey results uh, for early childhood, the question, like we said again, was having two 30-minute sessions, one or one in the morning or one in the afternoon. And that was pretty much a tie. <laughs> so there's, I mean, 35.9% uh, of our families said um, AM and PM, and then, you know, there's also uh, some that said AM was preferable. So, but the, there was one response, because I read all of the responses, that said, you know, is 30 minutes enough? You know, by the time the early childhood students sign in, it's time to go. So that's something to think about as well. And I really reached out to Jennifer Singleton on that too to get her feedback and feedback from her staff on what they felt with that. Well, can I ask what her feedback was? Sure, there? sure. Um, yes, uh, she, we talked about that and she talked to her staff and we proposed maybe a 45 minute, uh, one session in the morning um, because some of them were concerned that, you know, um, students in the afternoon, this is not a good idea really for early childhood. So maybe extending it a little bit more, um, just having one session. Also for high school, um, the question that was asked about starting at 8.05 versus 9.05. Um, so just a little bit more of our respondents felt that 9.05 would be a better time to start for high school. And that was based on your feedback of whether our high schoolers are supporting early childhood and elementary students. Um, so that was the feedback on that, on the high school. Um, so just this is basically, are you supportive of the schedule, the proposed schedule? And as I said earlier, 72.8% of the respondents are very supportive of it. So really just thinking about um, a possible new schedule based on the current feedback, uh, early childhood, well, first of all, the yellow is the old uh, schedule, and then green is the new proposal based on the feedback. Uh, for early childhood, 45 minutes versus 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the afternoon with the hour office hour. Elementary uh, feedback from some of the teachers were that they wanted the office hour to, but, um, to be right after um, the online session from 11 to 12 versus 11.45 to 12.45, we made that change. And then the high school starting at 9.05 versus 8.05, ending at 11.25 and having an office hour from 11.30 to 12.30. So that was based on the feedback of the same survey. Also, there were questions about the communication plan, work with Doug Gray, um, and it, to come up with some ideas on how to support the communication about AMI days, and we talked about updating the website, having some frequently asked questions for our families, recording a video, and then also one of the big things I think is really talking about this in uh, staff meetings with um, our teachers to ensure that they're clear about this as well. So are there any questions? I just want to thank you for going back out to the community. I think it is so important to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. And so, you know, we had the one, and then, you know, oh, okay, we got a little few more questions. So going back out and getting that feedback instead of just making decisions is, is so important um, to making everybody feel like they have a voice. So as the person who said that <laughs> had stated, so yes. Thank you. I appreciate you all actually doing this work um, just because the intentionality around what we had talked about before even coming into the meeting, like, you know, we don't have to do this work alone. So listening to the community from the first time, then the second time, we've talked about before as a board how we may survey the community, but we never really tell them the results. Well, we surveyed you, but hey, we still need a little bit more information to help us make a more informed decision. So appreciate that intentionality. I know it took a little bit longer, but appreciate it. <laughs> I'm going to piggyback off of both of them. Just thank you for listening and again going back out and re-looking at some of those dates and those numbers and times and 
keep less actually listening and focusing on what the community says and hearing parents. And I really like the comment of my voice. I feel like my voice was heard. I think it's important that you also talk to staff and even mm -hmm. kind of refine it a little bit more because that's really working in that community effort. So thank you so much. Thank you. Sounds sound like we got a much better plan moving forward because we have a lot more voices at the table. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, the next thing up is 3.6, and that's our bank depository bid. We look for our guidance from Dr. Phil Pusateri, our CFO. Good evening again, board members. Uh, state statute requires school districts to bid out bank services every five years. The reason for that is to make sure that the taxpayer dollar is going out to the lowest and best bidder. Uh, we've been doing that. I checked our records, and we're due for another bid to, for services starting this coming November. We prepared an RFP document. We posted it in the St. Louis County Inn, which is a, a newspaper for bids and legal services. We did receive three inquiries from three different entities, but only one of those entities bid, and that was St. John's Bank. Uh, they submitted their formal response. Now, St. John's Bank has been providing banking services for us for many years. Um, they have and will continue to provide services at no cost to the district. So typically there's bank fees. St. John's Bank waives all fees. Um, their interest rates will be the same basis that they've been offering us in the past, which is an uh, interest rate with basis points tied to the federal rate. So it's a good, solid rate, and there's no fees at all. So even though we just had one bid, I have no hesitation in recommending fully that the board approve St. John's Bank, St. John's Bank's proposal for banking services for November of this year through October of 2029. Thoughts, questions, comments? I think we're good. <laughs> then we need a? Before you make that, just one question I had on a different note. Um, thinking about the portrait of a graduate, um, one of the specific pillars is being financially literate. Um, so how is or are there ways that St. John Bank partners with the school district to contribute to that particular pillar for our students in our school district? I'm not for sure. Um, just at a quick glance, looking at some of the accounts that they have, I can see that many that were geared more towards uh, creating that type of um, financially literate youth, um, more for adults. So if there's any ways that St. John Bank can do that, that would be great um, with our district. It's an opportunity. They contribute to the district in a number of ways, but I wouldn't say that there's like the involvement of the financial industry in the classrooms. That's not been a part of the partnership yet. That's definitely an opportunity. We've got a strong partnership with Fletcher Wells and other members of the team. We've not broached the topic yet, but now that it's a uh, part of our portrait of a graduate, it's a conversation that we should have, and that's something that we can follow up with the board on after that conversation happens with Fletcher and Ms. Gilliam uh, to figure out how St. John's can fit into the portrait of a graduate. We anticipate having a winter convocation, which is going to be focused on the portrait of a graduate in January when the staff returns. My hope would be when we talk about district partners that we could talk a little bit about district partners, perhaps St. John around the financial literacy pillar. We could talk to staff about that. But at this point, it's an opportunity. And it can't be St. John. I'm okay with another bank, but I just feel like that we have to be more intentional with that. Excellent. I'd like to make a motion. To approve the bank depository bids presented to the Board of Education. Second. Good evening. Good evening. What's up? Oh, she can't. Go. Yeah, I was going to say. Gonna say no, I'm going to pass. Next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. E. Yes. Dr. Allen. Yes. Ms. Lomas. Yes. Mr. Gardner. Yes. Ms. Lincoln. Ms. Yes. Jones. Ms. Yes. Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I'll vote yes. 
Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we welcome our seventh member of the team. <laughs> Vanessa, welcome here. Moving on. Personnel recommendation, Mr. Michael Lachance. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening sir. Present personnel items 1 through 54. Hoping any questions or comments you may have and hoping for your approval. February of last year, and then um, JRRTC was aware that that's what we were doing as a stopgap until they gave us final approval, and just finally recently got a, a phone call approval and assurance that their documentation was on the way and that they are backdating her approval to April, um, which is apparently commonplace for them, and they have um, indicated you know, some of their delay was some, some things happening at the State Department and some revamping of some salary schedules for those officers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, so that's I've tried to add some details in the rationale, but it's, that's a unique situation. Okay. I would just say, wow, 24th year, 32, all the new channel changes. That's great to see our educators, you know, going out and raising that bar. Yeah. That's a lot. Yes. Michael, I see that we, we're getting like athletic trainers, managers, directors at the middle school level. Yes. Are we building up more and more? Sports programs after school and such for the middle schools? Actually, um, Drew Lomas has been working with the middle schools, trying to build up really feeder programs and beginning um, a friendly, competitive competition at the middle schools. And, and that's something that has, um, you know, they began with basketball and moving on to other schools. So each athletic director in the conference is taking on a mentee. Um, and we see coaches at the high school and at the middle school level as potential mentees to grow them into athletic directors down the road, whether it be in Rittner or elsewhere, um, because it's becoming a very difficult position to fill. Okay. Do we have often the letter of intent with a little asterisk, but then non Rittner employee? I just saw that at the very end. Yeah, that, that's our standard practice for those who aren't So um, I, I can get you more information. I too was not familiar with that. that and that is um, students from other countries that come and do the stay, AFF, AFS. Um, oh. It's not study oh, okay. abroad, but it's the students that come in for the home stays. Um, okay. Thank you. Exchange, exchange students. Exchange students, yeah. <laughs> I was like, why are you the button? And then I realized. That's a contact <laughs> at the school. Try to eliminate our abbreviations in those descriptions. That was one. Hunting down. There's no further questions. Look for a motion. I'd like to have a motion to approve personnel recommendations one through fifty-four as presented to the Board of Education. Second. second. Motion, and we have a second. Are there any questions or thoughts on these fifty-four items? Hearing that, we'll call the vote. 
Ms. Clover Jones? Yes. Mr. Gardner? Yes. Ms. Lotus? Yes. Dr. Alvin? Yes. Mr. Eaton? Yes. And then Enriquez Pippa? Yes. Very good. And I'll vote yes. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, board members. Okay, my fellow board members, we're to 3.8, which is board member comments. Do we have anything for the good and right of our school district? Yes. Hello. Good evening. Welcome. <laughs> um, first of all, sorry about the mishap. I didn't say this date as well as last Thursday, but anyhow, we're here. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick update since I missed my MSBA update. It's not directly tied to MSBA, but it is tied to advocacy in general. So, um, and I don't know if we reported on this, but the uh, political advocacy training that we had um, after Black and Orange Day and just how well I felt like that went, and Jennifer, please feel free to like give your two cents here, but um, it was a smaller group, but I felt like it was a powerful group and a really good conversation around working together as, as <coughs> North County, County schools um, so I'm actually, I have a follow-up meeting with Jennifer from Missouri Foundation for Health tomorrow to kind of debrief the experience, how she thought it went, what sort of next steps we could take from here. Um, there was a lot of really good ideas that came out of there, but I think the immediate sort of next step, it seemed like, um, so we had Jennings, Riverview Gardens, Normandy, uh, I think I'm missing. That's it. That was it? Okay, I thought Ferguson Florissant was there too. Oh, but yes. maybe, yeah. yeah. So uh, we have representatives from each of those school boards in attendance, and there was just a real sincere like um, hunger for more of this sort of education and training for all school board members, but more importantly, this like sort of coalition building with North County District. So um, the next step is to invite. Um, those districts into our Rittner Advocacy Committee space and perhaps we threw around the idea of like rotating advocacy um, committee meetings to like some of the other districts so we're not the only ones hosting it every time so all in all I felt like it was a really good time spent it was valuable um, and yeah and I can send out the slide deck with the presentation to all of you as well yeah yeah, the slides that she had provided, I totally blanked on it during that time, sorry. Uh, the slides that she had provided were very helpful and really around the advocacy about how we can do better about advocating. One of the things that I thought was really, like, struck me when we were to all talking, because it really just turned into a conversation with all of us, um, but one of the things that, you know, yes, we need to all partner together and work together as far as our districts. But the other thing that was great is we need to get out to other districts that are beyond our, our North County districts to make sure that they understand the needs that we have and, and the directions that we are going. Because, you know, we don't have a problem uh, with our own legislators. It's the ones in other areas and other districts that we need to make sure that they're hearing us too. So. You guys are great advocates for us, but we need to make sure that other um, districts are hearing, hearing the needs that we have too. And I, I think that was one of the pieces that everybody kind of talked about is we need to get out beyond us too. Yes, because we were talking about the, you know, our issues are the same when it comes to public education. Like we're all feeling the pain the same way, and so how do we? sort of show up in that in that solidarity not just yeah not just with us districts here but like the more rural districts that are also feeling that and so so the idea of like a joint lobby day or like a a larger lobby day with all public education advocates you know um i was kind of sharing that, that was like a personal dream of mine to see in the, some years from now just like people from all across missouri coming together to Jefferson City to say like we stand with public education and this matters to all of us. Um, so, but anyhow, it was really good. Yeah, it was really good. Thank you for putting that together. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's all I have. 
somebody else? Lisa? Rob? <laughs> no? The only thing I'd say is I just want to recognize I don't think they get enough is um, so our area coordinator for special school district Nathan Dwyer at the high school um, sent me a picture and I'm happy to share it with anybody that wants but they had their well, I'm getting ready to go back to school meetings and he showed up at special school districts with all of their employees dressed as the husky causing quite a scene in the middle of there <laughs> but just the the love that we see from our coordinators and that for our students is just outstanding awesome i'll wrap this up in the last 24 36 hours or so been kind of trying for the for the district and it, it has been said that if if we had new people in these key positions they, they might not be as well off right now mentally as we would hope we have a very good team a very good veteran team an experienced team that took us through these last few days and they came out on top our students came out better for it and it's, it might be easy to say, but I'll say it with all sincerity, thank you each and every one of you for the role that you played, for the hours that you put in. I know you didn't go to bed on time last night, and I understand <laughs> you're working on empty right now, but it's good work for our students, and we, we really do deeply appreciate your efforts, each and every one of you. And with that, well, maybe we should talk more and keep make the meeting go longer and keep them up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rob, make the motion on the consent agenda, <laughs> will you, buddy? <laughs> consent agenda items 4.1 through 4.13. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two. I got one, three. Oh. Let's yeah. just one, do, let's one, just do all of them. Be. It's one. Okay. One, three is and that's why you guys are all here to keep me on. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we approve consent agenda items 4.01 to 4.12. Second. Motion and a second. Let's call the vote. Ms. Henriquez Pivlet. Yes. Mr. Eaton. Yes. Dr. Alvin. Yes. Ms. Lonas. Yes. Ms. Glover Jones. Yes. Mr. Garden. Yes. Now vote yes. Since agenda items are approved, let's move on. Uh, we're going to reconvene in closed session. Uh, first, we got to go to closed session, right? I'd like to make a motion to reconvene in closed session for state statute 610021 for a discussion of a personnel agenda item. Second. A motion and a second. Mr. Garden? Yes. Ms. Dover Jones? Yes. Ms. Lonis? Yes. Dr. Alvin? Yes. Mr. Eaton? Yes. Ms. Enriquez Pimblet. Yes. And I'll vote yes. Let's take five and we'll come back.